So we are doing a mimer about the blowing of the great shofar, and it will be on that day. A great shofar will be blown, and those who are lost are going to come from the land of Ashur, and those who are nidach, uh, forsaken, will come from the land of Mitzrayim, and they'll bow down to Hashem. Now, this was a mimer that was taught by the Rebbe, that was given over, conveyed by the Rebbe, and Rosh Hashanah of the year 5728, which corresponds to basically September of 1967. So I have a question for you. We'll see if you know the answer. Well, not if you know the answer. See what your guess is, what your best guess is. When would you say, so we had Judaism happening in the shtetl. Then we had Jewish people coming over to Jewish people coming over to America. And starting from the, well, really the population increased in the late 19th century, turn of the century. And then of course in the Holocaust, and everyone came over to America. And uh, as everyone came over to America, everyone started getting more and more connected to Yiddishkeit. Would you say that's true or false? Less connected. Less connected. Very much so. You already had, of course, plenty of Jewish people who were already less connected in, in Europe. But then they, they came over to America and people were getting less and less connected. And if you were looking at the graph, at the chart of you know, Jewish no, observance, it would be in the, shtetl, in the shtetl it was here. And then by the time we get to America, it's going down like this. But then it starts to rise of people starting to get reconnected. And we call, we call it basically the Teshuvah movement where Jewish people start getting reconnected with their Yiddishkeit. And I know my family was definitely a uh, beneficiary of this amazing Teshuva movement. I don't know, I, I would assume I would assume some of us here, uh, some of us here also, I'm not sure where everyone went, but uh, some of us here also probably started getting reinvolved with Yiddishkeit. When did this Teshuva movement, when would you say it started? Around the same time as the hippie movement. Okay. So, all right. So you've now transferred the question to the hippie movement. And the hippies were, were a lot of them were Jewish, so they were looking for spirituality to replace the crass as materialism. Right. For sure. They a lot of for something a lot that of, meant. And a lot of them found it in Yiddishkeit, in Judaism. So this mimer, actually, as we're soon going to see today, this mimer was the Rebbe either A, recognizing, or B, helping to stimulate the Teshuva movement. This mimer was a discourse set in September of 1967. And the Rebbe says, that great shofar that's being blasted, guess what? It's bringing the Jewish people back to Yiddishkeit now. And so as we study this mimer, sometimes you study a mimer, it's informational, it's interesting information, it's questions, it's answers, it's esoteric, it's too esoteric, it's deep, it's too deep, I don't know what's going on, oh, I understand, oh, this is inspiring, this is, I don't understand this point, this point is whatever, right? Whatever's going on. But the Rebbe, this is a historical mimer. It's a historical discourse. Because this was the mimer that is inaugurating the Teshuvah movement, as we're soon going to see. And uh, Alan Jacobs, thank you. I, I, have you been to our class before, Alan? Uh, oh, I have not. I just started just the other day. Okay, well, welcome. Great to see you and your uh, Jewish you. professor. 
uh, background? Uh, sorry? My Jewish background? Um, yeah, your um, Jewish pride. I, I, you're breaking up on this. Ah. Okay. I think in, I think Matt. Um, I'm Ashton like I'm from from uh, I think I'm from Argentina. I'm sorry. So where where I'm are sorry. you? Where are you zooming in from? Where do you live? I live in the Jersey Shore, but my family is you know all over from Argentina and New York. Okay, very nice, very nice. So welcome, good to have you aboard. So we're kind of at the end I of the discourse. I here. wasn't sure if you were talking about his Jewish background or his background with the fist in the uh, ah, among ah, the, the, the Israeli I was flag. About his Zoom, his Zoom background. I was yeah, that's what I thought you were talking about, also. Yeah, right, right. Ah. I guess that's a question. That could, you know, when I talk about your Jewish background, it could be referring to to something very, very meaningful, or something not well, not quite as meaningful. Okay, we'll leave it at that. All right. Well, good to have you on board. We're gonna we're gonna jump back in. So, Alan, you might find this this discourse. We're kind of jumping at the end of the discourse. So, just uh, you'll get yeah, what you can if you have any questions. But uh, good to have I, you on board. Next I, time, Rabbi meet. told me November. Yeah, uh, I'm just I'm getting an introduction now. But you guys, you start in November again after Yom Kippur. Okay. Right, right. After, I think, Sukkot, after, yeah, after all the holidays. So we're going to uh, jump back into the Mimer over here. So we've been talking about, let me share the screen. So the Rebbe has been talking about this theme, which is a, a, recurring theme in Hasidic ideas, and that is that um, sometimes we do something, uh, you know, between God and the Jewish people, let's start from here, between God and the Jewish people, we're talking about a relationship, right? A, a love relationship. It's, it's a love story. So when you have a love story, when you have two people that, that love each other, so is it normal that that they fall in love exactly at the same time? No. One person falls in love and and they they then they initiate something, they do something to initiate. The person feels it and then they reciprocate and then that's how the relationship grows. In terms of our relationship with God as well, there is uh how shall we put this? Well, at the beginning of creation, God brought about a world without any human initiation. There were no humans, right? So God brought about all of existence, as our sages tell us, ki chafetz chesed hu, because God desires kindness. And so in his kindness, in his infinite kindness, he brought forth the world. But then, subsequently, there are now human beings, and particularly the Jewish people, and so through our work, we now, so to speak, arouse God to desire to recreate the world. So Rosh Hashanah, when we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, we are, so to speak, reminding God of his great joy, his great delight in the mitzvot that we do. And in order for us to do these mitzvot, well, we need a we need a world. We need a solar system. We need a we need the universe, right? The, without the universe, it would be impossible for us to do the mitzvot, right? So God says, "Good, I want to create the world once again." So the shofar is actually our uh, initiation from below, and then God reciprocates with bringing and drawing His divine light back into the world to recreate, to bring about once again all of existence. And so we were talking about the shofar gadol, the great shofar, which was originally, you know, in, it, in its normal context, it's not necessarily related to Rosh Hashanah. 
because the great shofar that we're talking about here, we say in the Shemona Esrei, Teka b'shofar gadol l'cheirutenu, right? We're asking God to blow the great shofar for our liberation. Talking about the ultimate and final redemption, may it come today. Before Yom Kippur, Mashiach will come. We'll see if it's too hard to build the Beit HaMikdash between now and Yom Kippur, but for sure, we can get up a Mizbeach. We already have the Dome of the Rock is, is already protecting the holiest spot in the world. The holiest spot in the world, according to reality, is the rock that is on the Temple Mount that's being covered by a dome. It's called the Dome of the Rock. And you can actually see the rock today. It's not like uh, the ark. The ark is a mystery. There was an ark. All right, we say there was a rock, ark. Nobody saw the ark. We don't know where the ark is. It was hidden. It was taken away. No, well, we say it was actually hidden. Rambam says it was hidden, but there, there could be different discussions about exactly what happened and where is it. We don't know. But the rock, the rock, the rock is the place upon which the holy ark went. And the Kohen Gadol is going to do the work in the Holy of Holies. That is, where is the Holy of Holies? The Holy of Holies is the room that has that rock. And upon it will be the ark. And in that room, the Kohen Gadol goes on, which day? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. It's the only day of the year that, yeah. that he goes in there, right? Yeah. God willing, will get the Beit HaMikdash back. The Kohen Gadol will go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And that will all be preceded by the Shofar Gadol, the great Shofar that calls. And what does it call? It calls out Jews who are lost. Jews who see, I should say, Jews who seem to be lost. Their bodies are lost. Their conscious mind is lost. But they have a homing device. Do you know what the homing device of every Jew is? The show. His or her neshama. His or her neshama. So we have something that calls and summons that. And that's going to be the great shofar, as it says in the Pasuk in Yeshayahu, Bayom Hahu Yitaka B'Shofar Gadol. On that day, a great shofar will be blasted. Now, is that going to be coming from human initiation or is that just coming from God? The verse seems to be showing that it's just blowing of its own accord. And, and the Rebbe is going to be discussing that here. Let's just go back a, a paragraph here. So it's possible, so it's possible to say that even when the revelation, that even when the revelation of the great shofar is drawn down and revealed by a person's approach of bittel, the shofar can be considered as having been revealed of its own initiative as reflected by the expression that will be sounded. So the Rebbe had been talking before about a person having such a service to Hashem that he feels that, you know, this is such a lofty level that the Rebbe has been describing here. He's been talking about this level of service of what's called bittel. Bittle means you are in an egoless state. So even when you do something in your mind, you haven't done anything. You're just a conduit. You're just a conduit for, you know, what God wants done. So I'm just doing what God wants. I, and I have no ego attachment in my service of Hashem himself. And so if a shofar is blown, I don't see that as I caused that. Um, I don't know about you, but... Uh, you know, it's like sometimes we like to take credit for things, right? Um, you can see, you, you can see a building, uh, you can see a house or an idea. And you can say, ah, I I spoke to the architect, I gave him that idea, or somebody's doing some great thing. You say, ah, that was my idea. We like to. That's human nature. At least, certainly, is my my nature. <laughs> I like to create take credit for things. It's quite normal to like to take credit for things. We like to feel important. We like to feel that we've made a, 
made, made a mark in the world. Yes, Rav David. You have a question, or you're just uh, point playing with your. You were saying about the, we have time to build the base of Mikdash for uh, for Yom Kippur, for Sukkot, for Yom Kippur. Then he tells you the base of Mikdash is already built. Ah, look at that! It's already done. It's all waiting in Shemayim. Right, they yeah, just come the doors on. You just have to put the doors on, right? There we go. That's, you know, don't have to deal with any general contractors. Ah, oh, a mechaya. No mortgage. No mortgage. Um, so, getting back to our story here of Bittel. Service of Hashem. The serv the Rebbe was talking about last time we met. We were talking about the service of Hashem, where we don't take any credit for anything, right? We we just see ourselves as a conduit for the divine service. And thus, when Hashem blows the shofar, we don't say, "Ah, I caused that shofar to blow." We do a mitzvah, and that mitzvah brings the Mashiach, but we would never want to go and say, ah, I did the mitzvah that brought Mashiach, because we don't, we're, we're egoless. That's that's all coming from a place of ego, and it's not a bad place. The Rebbe here is talking about a yet a, a, a loftier place of, of absolute egolessness. But what as poor and indigent that he possesses nothing of his own and everything which he is given is an expression of charity his outlook chase, uh, changes right we spoke about this last week although his divine service draws down revelation he realizes and senses that this is not a result of his own personal achievement in other words it's not that he has the power to draw down godliness but the influence comes as a result of the kindness of the Holy One, blessed be He. This is, this is just a remarkable level of humility that, that, that he was talking about. Thus, it is as if the shofar is being sounded on its own accord without any arousal from below at all. It is possible to add an element of explanation based on the statement of my revered father-in-law, the Rebbe, in his mimer entitled Bahaya Bayom Ahu. So now the previous Rebbe had a mimer with the same on the same verse talking about the great shofar, that the great shofar will arouse the fundamental Jewish spark that exists in every Jew. Uh, here we go. So we spoke before about Jewish people that appear to be lost. Their conscious mind, their body, their life experience is lost. But the great shofar will arouse the nikuda sayadus, the fundamental Jewish spark that exists in every Jew. It is thus understood that the desire every Jew, even those that are, so so to speak, lost and banished, will possess. The desire that every Jew will possess to leave the exile and ascend to Jerusalem and prostrate themselves before Hashem will come. You know why? Because the great shofar will arouse the true and fundamental desire of the Jew. Now that's pretty amazing. And here the Rebbe is saying this here not just as a, a beautiful point. He's not just saying this as, an ins as inspiring words. He's not just saying this to quote his father-in-law, which he's also doing it for that, for, for that reason. But what the Rebbe is doing is the Rebbe is helping to promote the, to, the Baal Teshuvah revolution in the year nine, in September of 1967. So here the Rebbe is helping to promote the Baal Teshuvah mo movement in September of 1967 by stating these, this word, these words. So these words over here are not just words of a mimer, although that would make them good enough for me. They're not just the Rebbe's holy idea, the Rebbe's holy, holy words. 
These words are actually eliciting from above the great shofar to arouse the hearts of the Jewish people below, to bring this about, to accomplish it. Uh, Isaac, I don't know if you uh, you heard this, but this mimer that we're doing is 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 from the uh, is from September 1967. No, I figured that out already by what you said introduced the Balchuva movement. And I was, I was born later, 77, 76. I had gotten more involved with the Babich, but yeah, now he was there. I remember the old days when you didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. Yeah, yeah. Baruch to, see, to, see a, to see a bearded Jew, again, as as. As David mentioned, if you saw a bearded Jew, he was a hippie, right? <laughs> I thought it was Smith Brothers with the uh, cough drops. Ah, okay. But that's just a picture from the olden days. But, but And they're not Jewish. Yeah, but they look Jewish. So this represents the difference between the redemption from Egypt and the future redemption. At the time of the redemption from Egypt, the Jews' desire to leave the impurity of Egypt and to cling to Hashem was prompted by a revelation from above. As reflected by the Pasuk, draw me after you. At the time of the future redemption, by contrast, the desire to leave the exile and come to Jerusalem will be the natural desire of the Jews alone. Where did I lose? The, the, the through line here? The screen. The, the, uh, the add-on screen. I, I didn't get it. Okay. I don't know. All right. I don't know. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. I don't know. It's okay. It's probably my computer. So the wrong... Uh, so the Rebbe explains though, that the revelation brought about through the great chauffeur will merely be a catalyst that will enable this natural desire to be revealed. Put in other words, once a Jew, well, once a Jew knows who he is, so then there's one course of action. Oh, but he, but but sometimes a Jew forgets who he is. So the shofar is a catalyst to help a Jew remember who he is. Ah, right. And so the rabbi's point over here is that the great shofar, that, 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 that this great return that is happening is actually happening. It's not caused by the great shofar, but it's merely a, a catalyst that will enable this natural desire to be revealed. Thus, the, the Jews' divine service will stem from their own initiative, the advantage of Rosh Hashanah, which is man's own divine service, but for those who are lost and banished in a literal sense, the divine service will come after the revelation of the great shofar, which will arouse man's true inner will, drawing down the revelation of the great shofar. However, the proverb will come from above. Not sure I totally understand this. It seems that the Rebbe is The divine service will stem from their own initiative. For those who are lost and banished, in a literal sense, this divine service will come after the revelation of the great shofar, which will arouse man's true inner will, drawing oh. down the The great shofar, however, will come from above. So, so far, apparently, the Rebbe is still saying that there's going to be a revelation from above. Moreover, there is also a deeper approach to the sounding of the great shofar dependent on the divine service of those on the advanced level in which drawing down the revelation of the great shofar will be accomplished through the divine service as explained above. Basically, when a person feels that their whole service, they're just a conduit and they're not taking credit for anything whatsoever. So now the great shofar is coming of its own. All right, we're not going to worry about it too much. We're going to... Uh, we're going to continue with the final, the final section of this mimer. 
On this basis, we can understand the verse, and it shall be, and it shall be on that day that a great shofar will be sounded. So there's a lesson to be taken from the prophecy that the great shofar will be sounded, although as above the verse implies that the shofar will be sounded on its own initiative, independent of our own divine service. So the Rebbe here is going to bring out a beautiful lesson. This was one of the opening questions that the Rebbe had in Mimer. What's the lesson for us? Okay, on, on that day, a great shofar will be sounded. By, by the fact that it's a great shofar will be sounded, that means it has nothing to do with us or our service, our work. So, that, so what's the, the lesson? What's the takeaway? Everything in the Torah has a lesson for us. What's the lesson from this great shofar? The Rebbe will now explain very beautifully a couple of points. So we are at the end. We are at the end period of the exile. Only moments are left until the great shofar will be sounded. Moreover, in a certain context, it can be said that the great shofar has already begun to be sounded. Oh my. So the great shofar has already started. The great shofar that's going to be blown, it's already started, the Rebbe says. As reflected in the Mimer of this uh, of this title delivered, delivered by my revered father-in-law, the Rebbe, this is particularly so since so many years have passed since the publication of that Mimer until the present day, and even more so since we have recently seen that many of those who could have been described as lost and as banished, heaven forbid, have been aroused to teshuva by the sounding of the great shofar. Wow. So I, so I'm trying to think that, trying to remember back in 19, uh, 1967, I was uh, I was four years old. I remember wow. it well. So, what did I, what happened in September of 1967? I, that was when, I, even though I came from a family of Jewish people that were not hadn't been involved with Yiddishkeit, in September of 1967, when the Rebbe said this mimer, that's when I started going to Jewish day school, to Torah Academy in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You see that? So I guess the shofar gadol, and guess what? I put a, at that age, I put a yarmulke on my head. Which I, I, June 67. What? You want to, you want to call the shofar? June 67 was the six-day uh, war. Of course, of course, right? And that, that also caused a great arousal of the Jewish people. Right, there's no question about it. I, I, but I'm making it very personal here. I'm making it all about me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm saying, but that may have had some influence also on your parents or whatever. Possibly, very possible. So you weren't up on the news at four years old. I was not up on the news. That's true. I I re, I, I came I came to it later on, and then I had to look back at it as history. All right. But, I, but I'm saying I when once I went to. Once I went to, to Jewish day school, I put a yarmulke on my head. And even though we weren't keeping kosher yet, we weren't keeping Shabbos, but my yarmulke was always on my head. So I, I'd ride around in, in my neighborhood on my bike with a yarmulke. And and I, I just never, I never took it off. So that was, it's still there, see? And it's just a funny thing. And little by little, our family came, you know, more and more religious. But I'm just I'm just trying to take these words of the Rebbe in a more uh, in a directly personal way. So the Rebbe said, and and, my, and trust me, my family before I was born, I have older siblings, and we moved in to uh, on a street in in Minnesota, and across the street was was an Orthodox Jewish family, the Friedmans, and. Um, they had siblings who were my brother's age, and a, and, a, and, a, and also they also had kids, also a daughter my sister's age. My brothers came home, 
And my mother said, how do you enjoy playing with the Friedman boys? So my older brother responded. He said, we like them. They're really nice, but we think they're Jewish. And then my mother, that's when my mother told him, oh, well, guess what? I got news for you. You're Jewish too. So here were my brothers, maybe three and four years old or four and five, whatever the ages were. They didn't even know that they were Jewish. And if not for Hashem taking our family and putting us right in across the street from an Orthodox family, right? Who knows if I would have discovered when I was, you know, 12 or 20 or 30, it says, oh yeah, my mother's Jewish. Like one of those people, you run into those people. Oh yeah, my mother's, my mother's Jewish. My grandmother is Jewish. I meet these people all the time. But this is all now, Baruch Hashem, the great shofar has started to sound. As the Rebbe says over here, and it already it's already started. And many of those who had been described as lost and banished, heaven forbid, have been aroused to Teshuvah by the sounding of the great shofar. The concept that the great shofar will be sounded on its own initiative emphasizes that our divine service must be characterized by Bittel, the awareness and the feeling that all of the effects brought about by one's divine service, those involve, involving oneself and those involving others, do not stem from one, one's own virtues at all, but rather are endowed to him from, ab from above. Excuse me. So this is a very big lesson here. It's very contrary to uh, very contrary to popular psychology. And, and and by the way, I don't I don't mean to say that the popular psychological approach that's also appropriate. And a person has to know where they're at and what and what they can apply. But this point the Reb is bringing across here is an amazing point, and that is to do your service without. The ego, without the ego. It's a, there's a very funny story about this. And I think it was it was either before Yom Kippur or before Rosh Hashanah. I don't remember which one, but Levi Yitzchak Bardichev. He was he was like pacing back and forth and back and forth, and then he 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 was you know he's going to go to the bima to blow the shofar. And he's, he's going and he goes up towards the beam and then he walks back, then he walks back and to and fro, fro and to. Then he gets up to the bima and then he pulls out the shafer and then he puts the shafer down and he, he walks out of the shul. Someone else, I guess, had to blow shafer. Afterwards, of course, his, his people wanted to know what was going on. So he said, I was going to go blow the shafer. I was going to go blow the shafer and I'm preparing myself. My evil inclination starts telling me, ah, Levi, Levi, don't worry, I'm here, I'm here with you. Your animal soul, your evil inclination, you're so you're such an important guy, you're gonna go blow chauffeur, trying to get into his head. And he says, No, no, I you I'm gonna leave you out of this. I'm just gonna go with my godly he says, No, I'm here. So so finally he thinks he banishes him, but and and he gets to the bima and he says, Oh, I'm here, Baruch Hashem. Then the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, says and it whispers in his ear, I'm here too. And finally says, if that's the case, you blow Shafer on your own. And he puts the Shafer down and leaves Shul. All right, it's a little bit, uh, might be a little bit much for us to, to handle. But the point is to get to a point where we can do an act without any desire for any pat on the back. I think this year, um, I think this year, it, it's really, uh, I, I felt something, you know, Rosh Hashanah and hearing the chauffeur and knowing about October 7th and of last year, I think that caused a, a movement too. And I think, you know, that, that aroused all of us, you know, and brought back a lot of people to Yiddishkeit. 
and uh, I think it's uh, very apropos yeah. what you're saying right now, as far as the 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 show for the doll and absolutely. what it is to me. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. And people aren't looking for the pat on the back, as right. you said. Uh, right. They're 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 finding the Yiddish kind of being, you know, they're being proud. Of, you know, it's bringing people together and and like uh uh you know a commute, you know, uh in more ways than uh, you would think. And uh, you know, I, I uh, it's, uh, it's it's unfortunate that such a tragedy happened. To, to make us come more together, but maybe that's Hashem's way of telling us, you know, and sounding that. Indeed, indeed. Very good point. I mean, those who could him to get the message out to us. Yeah, for sure. We have to look at it also. I mean, yeah, you also had World War Two. I mean, yeah, it's not just one thing. We're part of a flow. And now I think you can feel it almost in the air. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, yeah. That's, it's, uh, it's, we shouldn't forget. Baruch Hashem. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that we're at the point to say Baruch Hashem for the calamities that befall the Jewish people. I, it says, uh, when Mashiach comes, we're going to say, oh, in the Pasuk in Yeshayahu, Odecha Hashem ki anaftabi. We're going to say thank you, Hashem, because you have chastised us, because you have made our, you've given us such problems, such sodas. When Mashiach comes, then we'll be able to, to say Baruch Hashem. Right now, That's true. That's true. right now we can't say Baruch Hashem for that. My mother just says, always said, Hashem runs the world. That's yeah. all. The Amish to the Viet the Welt. That's for sure. That for sure we can say. So number one, we do the service because this is our job. This is who we are. And this is only a great merit for us. It's only being bestowed upon us. Not that you think that, oh, look, look at the great mitzvah that I did at all. So that's one lesson. That's the idea of the great shofar coming from above without our work because we should not give a significance and an importance and a and a prestige and esteem to our work, but rather realizing that anything that we want to give a prestige and esteem to, yes, there is prestige, there is esteem, it is very honorable, it is the most amazing thing, and it's not me. It's all from Hashem. This feeling that our achievements do not stem from our own virtues, but rather are endowed from above, will not necessarily lead to a weakening of one's efforts. It's interesting that he says here, not necessarily. In other words, I don't know. It could be. It, I have to see it in the Hebrew. I don't have it in front of me in the Hebrew, but it's a very funny word to say, not necessarily. What does not necessarily mean? That it might. <laughs> because, in fact, if I think, well, whatever I do, it's, it's all just Hashem and I'm not getting any pat on my back and maybe I will weaken my Yiddish guy because I'm a, you know, because sometimes we're not at the level of maturity that's expected of us. But anyway, so the Rebbe says here that it's not going to weaken his avoid. On the contrary, this feeling spurs a person to continue his efforts with even greater power when a person's divine service is connected with his own personal identity of necessity, it will be limited according to the nature of that identity. When a person serves God with all his might, well, that's even referring to commitment that surpasses his individual identity. It's still your might. The transcendence is relative and does not take the person entirely beyond his individual self. And this is an amazing, amazing point that Rabbi is making here. Rabbi. You you flipped the uh, you were sharing the screen, yeah. And now you went back to the regular where you're visible and. I want to give it. Yeah, I I went back because I want to give a speech now. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go for it. Uh -huh. I'm saying the Rebbe's point over here is that 
you know, we, we, we are so wrapped up in ourselves. It's very hard, very hard to get out of being wrapped up in ourselves. It's, it's, uh, you know, and, and, and it's okay. You know, it's all right. I don't, again, I don't mean to knock it because sometimes that's what we got. That's who we are. And that and play with, play with the, the, the hand that you're dealt. But the Rebbe is offering us here. You can go totally beyond yourself, totally beyond your limitations. You know, in Chabad, we, you know, we'll go, we'll, we'll speak to a Jew and we'll, we'll find a way in to get that person connected. And it's like, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, the, the step number one is to, to, to not be limited by yourself. When you're when you're doing something yourself and you're and you're looking for feedback for what you did, that is a necessary encumbrance. And honestly, in any work that you're doing, you know, if you're if you're let's say let's say you're working out, let's say you're you're trying to become healthier, you're trying to eat better, you're trying to or you're an artist, or you're, or you're an accountant, or you're whatever it is, whatever it is that you're doing. Any time that that what you're doing is dependent upon people's feedback, that's dependent upon your ego, and that that's going to be. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to mute over here. Sorry, I'm not sure where. It is. That's going to be an encumbrance to your work, to what it is that you're doing. When you can do it without that encumbrance, it allows you to do it without limitation, to do your work really beyond any limitations. And that, that's the point that the Rebbe is making here. And it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And that's the lesson. The shofar godel is going to be played. I, what did I do? And sometimes you meet a Yidle, you meet an old Jew or something, and it's like you want to give him credit for something. And there's just no way in the world that he's going to take any credit for any of the amazing things that he did, he's just it's just against his nature. This is an amazing thing, but but for each and every one of us to be able to do it in our own way. So the Rebbe says over here is that you can surpass your identity, you can surpass your, you know, your 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 uh, your way of seeing yourself. So when, by contrast, a person senses that the achievement brought about by his divine service, are not the result of his own power. That are endowments from Hashem. He transcends his own personal identity and limits entirely. How about that? How would you like to be able to transcend your own identity and limits entirely? Mm. His divine service is thus entirely unbounded and unrestrained in a good way, and he's capable of overcoming all challenges. We all know those, those times in life when we say that we, you know, we can't. We can't do it. That's easy to understand. But we know those moments in life where there's no such thing as we can't. And you just go forward and accomplish in the most amazing way. And so this is the lesson that Rebbe says, the idea of the chauffeur sounding of its own accord. So what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to do it without getting any, without having any ego involved whatsoever. And that's the lesson. The mimer entitled Vahaya Bayemahu in Lakuta Terra. So this is all. This is all the ver the verse from Yeshayahu, chapter 27, verse 13. And it shall be on that day that a great shofar will be sounded, and those who are lost in the land of Ashu, and those who are banished in the land of Egypt shall come and bow down to God on the holy mountain. So this was a binder. All of the Maimarim that we're quoting here, this is a Maimar from the Rebbe. But it's all, uh, it's based on, all of the discourses are based on a discourse taught by the first Chabad Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, in a book called Lakute Torah. He explained, with regards to the sounding of the Shepherd and Rosh Hashanah, 
And although the divine energy is drawn down primarily through the cry that emanates from one's innermost heart. Rabbi, I think you might have to mute the background. I might have to what? Mute the background. Okay, I, I've got to find the... The mute is so. I know, this is always a challenge to find the right button to push participants. Here we go. Mute so. There you go. Now, if you want, you can speak up. I'll just read your lips. Okay. So the Rebbe, now the Rebbe is going to go and, and, and talk about another interesting point over here. And that is that, you know, the Shaifer represents the crying out of the heart. And we have to have this crying out of our heart to connect to our Father in heaven. It's that an actual physical shafer be sounded for deed possesses the highest potential and this act also causes the revelation of God's inner will the sublime shafer to be drawn down to the material realm in other words person can think, well, the whole idea of the Schaefer is, is representing the inner cry of the soul. Let's all get together and, and, and conjure ideas that are going to cause us to cry out to Hashem from the inner depths of our soul. And we'll all be crying and sobbing. And we'll be doing the tekiyas, the crying, the long crying wail. And we'll be doing the trua with the sobbing. No. Hashem said, it's going to be a day of trua. We are commanded to blow a physical shaifer. So we are meant over everything else to be obedient to what it is that Hashem is asking us to do. In the physical realm, this is what God wants me to do. And that action is supreme. And the, the physical act of blowing the shaifer causes the revelation of God's inner will to be drawn down into the material world. From this, we can conclude that similar concepts apply with regard to the sounding of the great Schaefer. All the efforts that have been undertaken until the present are not sufficient. And the sounding of the great Schaefer has to be so loud that the entire Jewish people, even those lost and banished, shall come and bow down to Hashem on the holy mountain in Jerusalem in the most literal sense so Hashem has to blow this great shafer so much. So Hash this is maybe, perhaps, the Rebbe is saying, we have to do more work. The Rebbe is perhaps saying, Hashem, you have to blow your shafer even louder to call more and more souls that they should, uh, that who, who are lost and banished, that they shall come and bow down to Hashem on the holy mountain in Jerusalem, in the most literal sense. May this happen in the immediate future, led by Mashiach, who will lead us upright to our land. That is the conclusion of the Mimer. So thank you for uh, accompanying me on this journey. Anyone want to share any uh, deep and meaningful Rosh Hashanah ideas? Anybody experience or maybe your rabbi? Or somebody shared some deep Rabbi, beautiful Moshe. The Sachtas should be long lasting and not only temporary for a few yeah, days. Amen. 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 I try to keep simplifying things down to the core basics because I believe it can't be that complicated. Because if a five year old can understand it, and a teenager can understand it, an adult can understand it. It can't be too, I mean, I know you learn Tyra, whatever, you can get really into the dre, but I'm talking about very simple. No, you can, and it's a pleasure, and I love it. Oh, yeah. But in terms of the essence for the purpose of Amuna and Bitochen, I find for me it works better to keep it really simple, but intense. The, the question is not the simplicity. The question is the sincerity that goes into it. Absolutely. So I've been known for saying for a long time that everything in life is willing and able. We are in charge of willing. 
Nobody can make you want to do something. Nobody can stop you from wanting to do something. That's a hundred percent in your control. Isaac, I've got a, I've got a question for you then. Yes. We all know that where there is a will, there is a way. No, no, that, that, you're jumping but, ahead. But, it's, it's but, but I know, I know, I know, no, but I have a question on this one point. Sorry. We'll get back to Abel in a moment. But my question is, is there a way to create the will? Of course. How? That but that gets to that gets to Abel. Okay. Which means willing is a hundred percent in our control. Abel is a hundred percent not in our control. Okay. That's all upstairs. So however you want to translate it, that's already the Abishta's land. I look at life as basically it's only me and our Kaddish Baruch Hu. And even the me is the illusion. So I'll play along. I'll play the game, fill the role, and I'll play Isaac. That's fine with me. But other than that, the only real entity in my life is Hashem. I'm constantly talking to him. I'm constantly, what are we doing now? Why did we do this? Is the way I look at life. But I just want to get to my important point, which I thought was important for me. So what you're saying, a Vartan Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Yomim Naraim. Rosh Hashanah is all upstairs. Hashem Melech. We have to lose ourselves and all we do is boost Hashem. Yom Kippur, the effort flips around and we work completely on ourselves. In terms of what do we have to do to cleanse ourselves of whatever whether it's apologizing, whether it's chuvo, the different methodologies. That, I've never seen that anywhere, but that's all I was thinking right. about getting Beautiful. into it. Beautiful. Very nice theme for the, uh, the Yomim Neirayim. Okay. The part about Hashem is over. You don't have to sit there. You already accepted Hashem, Melech. So now you can flip, make believe you already got that point, and now flip back and look at yourself because that's your job now. Yeah, the Very good. Very we good. do vidoy. We do everything we do in your Kippur is us. It's a lot. Yeah, a lot of vidoy, huh? It's a lot. Oh, I look at it this way. I'm sorry. I Rosh Hashanah I spent being grateful for everything Hashem gave me over the last year. I wasn't worried so much about next year. I, see. I was very grateful and looking at what I got from Hashem in the past year. Right. And what and it was not that hard to say Hashem Melach because right. thank you very much and this is what you did for me. Right. This we go into, I go into a little bit more with Pachet because I, I know how much I got to work on myself. Now the question is, what do we give back to Hashem? What do we give back to Hashem? Am I giving our you? cleanse, our cleanse in the Shamas? We well, do are, we the giving, are we giving back to Hashem? adequately based on what Hashem, the blessings that Hashem has given us. Never. I'm saying that, like, I'm saying like, that's, Yom, and that's Yom Kippur. Hashem Yom Kippur. I gotta do my work, right? Right. Okay. Very good. All right, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. I wish you a Gemar Chasim and uh, and uh, you should have a, a, a very joyous Yom Kippur. Um, and an easy a a fast. And a good Shabbos. Thank you, Thank you Rabbi. Thank well, you. Uh, I wish you a a Get the meeting until after Sukkot. So. Uh, all right. Be very well. Thank you very well. Thank you, Rabbi.
Every time I annoyed you with the pit, this I know for sure is a big one. For all the times I annoyed you in the past year, please forgive me. It was meant with sincerity, with good reason, and not just myself. Thank you. Call to you well. 